So now we'll just continue to see how those lost tribes we can locate in them, brethren, how they united with scepter. Uh, the scripture reading basically uh, related to this subject would be Jeremiah chapter 31. And uh, basically the entire chapter is related to uh, this location of the lost tribes and their unification with scepter. Now, just in brief, how did they unify with scepter? Well, as you remember, Jeremiah's commission was to overthrow the throne in Jerusalem and then to pluck up, you know, the throne to take from the highest part of the cedar, the tender branch, which was a princess, Ta Te Tefi, Tamar Tefi, to take her over to lost Israel, which was at that time on British Isles and also in Ireland. And then she, being the descendant of the last Jewish king Zedekiah, she married in Ireland Eohait Heremun, her husband, who was also king of the Irish. Now, the Irish in general are descendants of the tribe of Dan, and they're also part of the lost Israel. However, the uh, kingly line in Ireland was also of Jewish descent. Because Judah had two sons, remember, Phares and Zara, And both of them, they were twins, and they both had the same right to the throne. However, only one of them, the one who came out of the womb first, which was Phares, uh, was able to establish the kingly line in the Promised Land. And from his line came all the Israelitish and Jewish later kings, all the way up to Zedekiah, until the throne was destroyed in Judah. However, Zara had the same, exactly the same right to the throne. But Zara was unable to establish kingly line in the Promised Land. So Zara went with wandering Israelites and he established throne in the lost Israel. Uh, and uh, when these two came together, Tamar Tefi from the Pharisee line and uh, Eohait Hermon from the line of Zara, then this breach between the brothers, remember we talked about the breach, was healed and from them continued then the long line of Irish monarchs. Later the throne was overturned from Ireland to Scotland and that was the second overturning. And then later from Scotland it was overturned for the last time and it was moved to London. That was the third and the last overturning of the throne. Remember it was prophesied that after Jeremiah plucked it up, after the first overturn, there will be two more. I will overturn, overturn, remember twice. We'll come back to this subject certainly in the future, brethren. And uh, just to establish them more firmly. Especially because we'll come to those subjects as we analyze the uh, wonderful book, booklet. Actually, it is more book. The United States and Britain in Prophecy. When all these things that we have been touching upon in these lessons have been kind of... Uh, uh, elaborately explained and my particular concern again I keep uh, pounding this to you because it is important brethren because sometimes we you know for decades read the Bible for years we read the Bible but sometimes we don't get some basic facts about the Bible you know uh, and uh, this is what I'm telling you about Leviticus chapter 26 now nobody spelled it out to me this way the way that I'm spelling it out to you I keep telling you it's a pivotal uh, prophecy in the Bible. It's the foundational prophecy about the Israel. It's dual in nature. Obviously dual in nature. It does refer to the ancient Israel, but it also does refer to the current modern Israel. Interestingly enough, that prophecy is given in the book of the book of uh, Levitical in the Levitical book, in, you know, in the among the laws for the priests. Levitical priesthood, which is even more important. But you know, uh, I realize I, I I don't understand. I don't really know how much do we realize. I've come to this conclusion. This is again, this is my conclusion because uh, the uh, the Leviticus twenty six is part of the Pentateuch, the fi first five books of Moses. The pen the the five books are the foundation of all the Bible. And many people haven't even realized, brethren, because when they think about the first five books, books of Moses, they, they think about Genesis and how humans came to being, and they think about Israelites and Exodus, uh, they think about the history of Israel, they think about the laws. But they rarely stop to think that, brethren, it is amazing. We have the prophecy about the whole world right there in those five books. 
You will see how amazing that is when we are going to analyze each particular tribe. You will see that even in Genesis, the very first book of the Bible, we have prophecies that are being fulfilled right now in our time. Because Jacob prophesied to his sons, that is to their descendants, in the last days. So people rarely stop to think they understand that also the first five books of Moses are prophecies. Not only the law, not only the history of Israel, not only the creation of the world, yes, all of that, plus, plus prophecies for our time. I wonder how many of us understand it, brother. Well, we need to start to grasp that. That's what makes Leviticus chapter 26 even more amazing. Even more amazing, for example, just to give you a brief example, it says your, your, your cities will be destroyed. Now stop and think, brethren. Stop and think. It was said in Leviticus 26 when Israel was yet in the wilderness. There was no Israelite city back then. And yet, before Christ, when Israel was in the wilderness, there was a prophecy. So God was having so this for, 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 uh, foresight, amazing foresight to see what Israel, what condition of Israel will be, that he'll have to punish them that way. So the prophecies relate, you know, that's what makes it amazing. Sometimes we read those, those things and we wonder, okay, your, your cities will be, will be destroyed. Yes, we know they will be destroyed because we have read the prophets, we understand the Bible. But we don't stop to think, wait a second. This was given to Israel when Israel was still in wilderness. There was no city of Israel back then. Which shows, goes on to show us again, brethren, that those, that prophecy in Leviticus 26, is, it is actually dual in, in character. So the Bible, the first five books of Bible, brethren, not only contain creation of the man, the fall of man, uh, uh, history of Israel, and the laws of God, statutes, laws, and judgments, but it does in involve... There are just all those prophecies right there in those first five books. Leviticus 26 is, and cor is corroborated later by Moses' prophecy in Deuteronomy 28 and 29, also related to Israel. He also prophesied to each particular tribe, and he also, relay, uh, he also uh, prophesied what will happen to Israel in the last days. That is amazing, brethren. So we need to understand again that the prophecies, these prophecies are... Why, why do I keep underlining all the time that? Because what do you think, brethren? What do you think, based on what, the prophets of the Old Testament were warning Israel? Yes, they were warning Israel that Israel was going to be punished for breaking the laws given in the books of Moses. However, what did they prophesy to Israel and to Judah? They prophesied to them that they would be, you know, that they would experience uh, uh, occupation, starvation, or hunger, uh, that they would have droughts, all kinds of things. And yet, all those things did happen to Israel. So based on Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28 and 29, which corroborates Leviticus 26, Israel got warning because, you know, those prophets had something to call upon. They would just show to Israel, look, this is what it says in the five books of Moses. And this is what is going to happen to you if you are going to break God's law. Now, brethren, the same continues in the New Testament, in the New Covenant. What is the Great Tribulation, brethren? It is based, Jesus Christ confirmed in the New Covenant, in the New Testament, the Great Tribulation. Which is also called in Jeremiah chapter 30, if you go verse 6, it's called Jacob's Trouble. So Jeremiah prophesied there will be Jacob's Trouble based on Leviticus 26, based on the first five books of Moses. Jesus Christ confirmed all the Old Testament prophets and didn't elaborate. We don't find in the Gospels any elaboration. There was no need to repeat what is already there, where? In the first five books of Moses, brethren. So Jesus Christ confirmed it will be all that has been prophesied will happen to modern Israel. And didn't repeat anything from the Old Testament. There was no need. We have it already there. Where do we have it? In the first five books of the Bible. So I just want you, I want you to understand this, uh, how important this is. I've come to this conclusion, I mean, uh, uh, myself. And if I'm wrong, yeah, well, then 
please correct me or there will be God will have to correct will certainly correct me if I'm wrong but my conclusion is how how we never really uh, viewed the foundational books of the Bible as also the prophecies for our time and they are so yes again they contain the creation of man the fall of man you know and losing his 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 glory with God the history of Israel laws statutes and judgments yes indeed and brethren and prophecies prophecies for ancient Israel and prophecies for modern Israel that's how amazing is the book that we have and that's how we should be understanding that the whole history of the world I repeat brethren is right there in the Old Testament for example remember Genesis chapter 10 what is Genesis chapter 10 the table of nations how do we know various things now about the nations well because we have Genesis chapter 10 and we figured out you know who's who is whose descendants and, and and that's how amazing that all that is so the you know the, the the foundational books the first five books of Moses have really laid foundation for the entire Bible based on that foundation the Old Testament prophets were warning ancient Israel based on that foundation Jesus Christ just confirmed that the Old Testament prophets are true and confirm that foundation himself based on that foundation the Apostles because remember the New Testament wasn't written until basically and wasn't canonized until basically the end of the first century when the Apostle John was toward his, the end of his life so the Apostles what did they have they had the Old Testament only which is uh, which is as Paul writes to Timothy which is able to make you wise unto salvation in Jesus Christ so that's how important is the Old Testament and that's how important is uh, the foundation of the whole Bible the five books of Moses brethren so please keep in mind that there in those five books I've said it very often when I was interviewed by my friend Gene Porter that I am amazed how much the whole history of the world is in those first five first five books of the Bible and if you want me to be even more concrete the whole history of all Israel today, modern Israel today, these end last uh, last days, is right there in the very first book of the Bible, in Genesis. You'll see that as we'll go through each particular tribe, brethren. How much we'll have to go back to Genesis and the Old Testament scriptures to understand modern Israel, because again, Genesis chapter forty-nine, the prophecies of Israel were for the last days. So the Israel of today. That's how amazing is the Old Testament. That's how amazing are the first five books. Now let's get let's get uh, get to our subject, lost tribes of Israel. We are locating them. We'll be locating them each particular tribe. But let's give them some general locations. So we have the whole chapter thirty-one, brethren, in Jeremiah, from chapter one, from verse one all the way through the end of that chapter, basically is the scripture that you might want to read in your free time and memory verse within this very chapter for this would be verse 7 Jeremiah chapter 31 7 for thus says the Lord sing with gladness for Jacob and shout among the chief of the nations proclaim give praise and say O Lord save your people the remnant of Israel and indeed brethren there will be remnant also to be saved indeed even after the great tribulation uh, they will be remnant and in fact uh, the whole uh, the entire chapter 31 speaks about the remnant of Israel saved now why do we th speak about the remnant well because that's how we are going to locate and uh, find locations of the tribes today because they'll be returning to their own promised land in that very great second exodus and how how blessed brethren we are that we have reestablished understanding of the second exodus as no other churches out there have done brethren as no other church of god has done and no wonder we have god has done it through us because we are a philadelphia remnant and last sabbath we had such an amazing proof you know that we are a philadelphia remnant i was going to i was going to fast actually uh, to be in my fast following the Sabbath and I was going to pray to God as we are approaching Pentecost that we would show in action more that Philadelphia kind of love and we did we did even you know shortly after I began my fast we had a wonderful display to me a wonderful truth and proof 
that we are a Philadelphia remnant, and that's how it should continue and will continue indeed. As a Philadelphia remnant, we have raised again the awareness of the second exodus. All these Laodicean churches of God are not doing that. They just keep quiet as there is nothing of a sort. Brethren, we need to understand the second exodus and we may not understand every detail, but the magnitude of the second exodus and the miracles that will follow the second exodus, we now do understand. The first exodus will pale into insignificance, as the prophets tell us. So here is one, one of those, you know, remnant, remnant of Israel say Jeremiah chapter 31. That's exactly what it tells us, where the Israel will be returning to its promised land, which shows us, by extension, where they are now, or, or that is where they ended up after being kicked out of their promised land because of their sins and after losing their identity. So we have seen Jeremiah, because we are in the book of Jeremiah, how Jeremiah accomplished you know, the overthrow of David's throne, how he took a daughter of King Zedekiah of Judah to the lost house of Israel. And I drew to your attention, the lost house of Israel was in Northern Ireland. I drew to your attention the flag of Northern Ireland. The flag exactly reflects the history of Northern Ireland. The Jewish line, kingly line of Zara, could not rule in among the Jews and among Israelites in the promised land. So they were they started their rule in lost Israel. So you have a red hand, red scarlet hand, red scarlet hand, which is basically uh, which is placed uh, within the uh, David's, which is called David's star. So the heraldry itself testifies to the truth, brethren. There are many things there in heraldry. You will see, for example, the British heraldry, the American heraldry, the American national national seal, the uh, uh, British uh, the British unicorn, brethren. All of that is proof, undeniable proof, about their Israelitish origin. They cannot deny it, even if they want to. Even though many of them will say that doesn't really matter. Who cares? Well, to them it doesn't care, but they keep forgetting one thing. They're God's people Israel. The eyes of God are on his people Israel. Because unlike Israelites, who are terribly unfaithful, just like Hosea's wife, whoring after all these other doctrines and theologies, and this whoring with this false Christianity, brethren, unlike them, God has always been faithful and remained faithful, and has been so merciful to the point that he because he is the husband of the Old Testament, Jesus Christ, he died. And by his death, he freed modern Israel to remarry. So Israel can now marry, be married again to him, of course. How amazing is the plan of God and how intricate and beautiful is Israel involved in that, brethren? Again, I keep repeating to you. The key of David given to Philadelphia Church is understanding all of these aspects of Israel, brethren. We must never give up on this truth. Never. And speaking of giving up on the truth, let me tell you one thing, brethren. Let me state it publicly to all of you. Because I've just remembered, I, 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 this, this, as we're approaching Pentecost and the importance of Pentecost, why the church and uh, what's the purpose of the church i've come to realize i've come to remember how all these important doctrine including israel were played down and eventually kicked out of the preaching you know brethren if you ever hear me starting to preach only about love grace and mercy and if you never hear me preaching about the entities mentioned in the Bible, like the Roman Catholic Church, papacy, the first beast. Well, they know that something must be wrong with me, brethren. Because that's how it all started, you know. There was no longer was preaching about the mark of the beast, about the first and the second beasts. I'm speaking about the WCG. And I'm seeing, I've seen that in some other Protestant churches where the Jesuits infiltrated as well and just subverted that preaching. What was their tactic? Well, you stopped preaching about, you know, you stopped saying 
anything about the first and second beast because it's criticism. Do not criticize. We cannot criticize Roman Catholics. Well, we don't criticize Roman Catholics. We criticize Roman Catholic theology. We feel sorry for those people who are caught up in that theology, but we have to speak about the institution, brethren. Oh, don't be negative. Let, let us be positive. Let's preach about love and mercy and grace. And that's about it. Brethren, if you ever hear me only preaching about that, and you don't hear me preaching about the house of Israel and second Exodus, brethren, thing, then be realized that something is wrong with me. And beware then. Because that's the Satan's tactic, how he downplays, you know, they still use the Bible. Yes, grace, knowledge, grace and love and mercy. It's all part of our character. It should be. It's part of the teaching of the Bible. But that's not the primary teaching of the Bible. The Bible has got some other things. The Bible has got, as I told you, the history of whole world, brethren, recorded on its pages. So the truth about Israel, we must never give up on this truth, brethren. If we want to be a Philadelphia remnant, we cannot because the key of David is given to Philadelphia. How can anybody in his right mind fathom giving up on the identity of Israel? No way. When God's eyes are upon his people all the time. So faithful that he came into flesh. He died to free the same house of Israel to be able to remarry. So how dare somebody abolish the truth about Israel downplayed? But people dare, yes. The Laodiceans, you know, for the sake of compromising with the world, will, brethren, either abolish or will just downplay. Laodiceans will downplay. And some people have just apostated. They have fallen away from this truth, which I'm afraid puts them in a very dangerous category. I wonder, you know, I wonder how will they respond to God in the Day of Judgment? And how will they explain to him? Well, yes, we read Jeremiah 31, for example, about the second exodus, but we didn't think it was important, really. You didn't think that was important. God who remains, I mean, to the very end of the Bible, remember, brethren, 12 gates. I'm going to mention that even in the day of Pentecost, brethren. I'm preparing for you the book of Ruth. Ruth was a Gentile. But, brethren, all the Gentiles have to become Israelites because God had always had... He's always had one wife. It was Israel. And I'm sorry if somebody feels that's racist or somebody feels that's unjust. Well, try to accuse God that he is unjust. So Ruth became Israelite. She had to become physical Israelite, you see. We, brethren, as we turn and be converted, we become spirit-led Israelites. Right there at the end. In the book of Revelation, the very last book, what do we read? We read about the 12 gates, each having the names of who? The tribe, 12 tribes of Israel. So to the very end, we have Israel. And after all, let somebody be offended if he or she wants to be. But I'm saying this, and I'm not living in physical Israel. The book, what we have, Bible, is history of Israel from cover to cover. And other nations are also included as they come into relationship with Israel. That's what it is. That's the fact. And I'm sorry if somebody doesn't like it, somebody may not like it, but that's the fact. That's the word of God. And we should be happily embracing it and embracing our identity, brethren. Spirit led Israel. I often started to tell you, to always ask you, to, to tell you, to caution you, remember who we are. We must never remember, we must never forget that is who we are. So anyhow, we have seen how Jeremiah transplanted that throne from Judah to the lost house of Israel. So he planted the throne of David anew among the lost Israelites. Now we are now, we can now also see the actual location again and identity of the house of Israel. We'll get into more details later. But let's see, for example, Amos. Amos chapter 1 verse 1. And as we are turning there, let me again, yes, I know sometimes, not sometimes, very often I go into digression, brethren, but I do because, again, I'm trying to give you, I'm trying to give you some other, in the meantime, besides the main subject, some other nudges of information that might be useful for your understanding of the Bible. Amos was, the words of Amos, chapter 1, verse 1, who was among the sheep breeders of Tekoa, which he saw, un, uh, which he uh, which he saw concerning Israel in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, 
the son of Josh, king of Israel, two years before the earthquake. So here we have the house of Judah and the house of Israel are already separated. And anyway, to whom does the prophecy concern? Concern. Well, brethren, it says, he said, verse 2, the Lord rose from Zion and utters his voice from Jerusalem, the pastures of the shepherds mourn and the top of Carmel's wither. And then he continues about Damascus and so on. But anyway, brethren, he says the words of Amos when he was in Tekoa, which he saw concerning Israel, brethren. So this prophecy of Amos is concerning Israel. He was obviously in a Jewish, Jewish settlement. But this concerns Israel. And the aggression I wanted to give you is that the, this, this, this place, Tekoa, is very interesting today. It's populated by the American Jews who emigrated to Israel. Now, it's interesting because once upon a time, it must be 10 or plus years, I've heard this amazing sermon, which lasts for about three hours, that the word Tekoa means pitching of the tents, brethren. And it's not far away, that place is not far away from Jerusalem. And this sermon was saying, this again, don't take it as a doctrine, but take it just as an information. Because it came from one of the uh, greatest personalities of the old WCG, the late Gerald Waterhouse. He said that Tekoa, meaning pitching of the tents, might be our temporary dwelling on the, place, on the way to the place of safety. Because Petra is not far away. Tekoa is not far away from Jerusalem, and the very meaning of the of the of the of the place, pitching the tents, might indicate that it will be place where the church, as it flees from persecution on the way to the place of safety, might stay for a while. And then he also mentioned that that uh, the words of Jesus Christ. Then, when you see the abomination of the desolation in its place. Let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. That might refer to those who will be in Tekoa, brethren. That's an indication. So, you know, so that you would know whether that will be the case or not. Those who will flee to the place of safety will be witnesses to that. But I'm just relating this information to you because I found it very interesting. So the word Tekoa means pitching of the tents. Now, Amos is speaking again concerning Israel. So, you see, what kingdom or what government, does he say, was to be destroyed? And was the house of Israel to move on among other nations after going to Assyria, intermarrying among the other nations? Well, brethren, the end of his book, and please underline, mark, and remember this. Verse, that's chapter 9, verses 8 and verse 9. And brethren, I literally believe that this was fulfilled. Again, keep in mind this, brethren. A large number of Israelites did get together and God obviously provided for them to uh, gather themselves in Northwest Europe, British Isles, later in America, in order for them, being descendants of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, to fulfill the last days of prophecies for Israel given to them in Genesis and Deuteronomy. However, brethren, however, for some reason, why did we miss this in the past? I don't know. But for some reason, brethren, we have missed the fact that among the Gentile nations today, there is a large number of lost Israelites, brethren. Some of them have completely lost their identity Various tribes among various nations, you have it even on internet, you can find some information. Some of them didn't really lose everything. Some of them have got, have got some uh, traditions and uh, uh, traditional stories about their origin. And they claim to be lost Israelites. And there must be true, brethren, because how do you explain, for example, that the, the, the flower lotus which is Solomon's flower from the Solomon's temple. How do you explain that to be an integral part, for example, of the Japanese Tsarist regalia? There is no other explanation. So, chapter 9, verse 8. Behold, 
the eyes of the Lord are on the sinful kingdom. Now, this is the sinful kingdom. So, what kingdom, what government was going to be destroyed? The sinful kingdom, King House of Israel. As you remember, the uh, house of De uh, the house of Judah also went the same way of Israel. However, there were still kings, for, uh, two or three kings. You know, after the separation with Israel, two or three kings were there who were very righteous. Josiah was one of those kings. Jose uh, Josiah and Josephus, they were very righteous kings. But the very sinful, completely sinful from Jeroboam, that's why Amos was prophesying, you know, to the kingdom of, of Israel. From Jeroboam on, all of the Israelitish kings were paganized, brother. They were pagan, they just they were just total apostates. There was no basically there was no righteous king among the ten tribes of Israel. Only few righteous king remained in the history later in that line of the of the of the uh, of the kings of Judah. Few of them. On the sinful God's eyes are on the sinful kingdom, and I'll destroy it from the face of the earth. And brethren, that happened. And in the book of Hosea, one of these days we'll probably go through the whole book of Hosea. We can see how that happened. The whole Israel was, the house of Israel was destroyed. The ten tribes of Israel in the northern part of the Holy Land in Samaria were kicked out of their land. And remember the uh, various tribes, five tribes from Assyria and Babylon were settled instead of them, settled and replaced them in the, that land. That's how Samaritans came to be. The Samaritans who you know, mixed the Old Testament terminology and their terrible, horrible Babylonian, pagan, awful practices and, 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 and heathen customs. And they claim to be the chosen people of God. Out of that culture, out of that melting pot of paganism came Simon Magus, true, famous Simon Magus, who was opposed to the apostles and later moved to Rome and established the Roman, what is today the Roman Catholic Church. He was the first pope. So the kingdom of Israel was destroyed. The Israelites were replaced by Babylonians and Assyrians in their land. And the Israelites from that place, after being taken by the Assyrians, they just continued to be scattered among the nations, brethren. And then God continues, Yet I will not utterly destroy the house of Jacob, says the Lord. For surely, verse 9, I'll command and I'll sift the house of Israel, among, brethren, please, what does it say? Among some nations, among few nations, among several nations, among African? No, among all nations. As grain is sifted in a sieve, yet not the smallest grain shall fall to the ground. And I, brethren, believe Israel among all nations. If it says all nations, I take it for his word. It must be then all nations. Stop now for a while and think, brethren. What does it mean all nations? That means also all races. Because all nations have different races. And therefore do not be surprised why we have the lotus flower, you know, regalia, part of, of, of Japanese tsar, tsarist regalia. Why should we be surprised? If it is all nations, that's all races as well, which means Israel will be today assimilated with lost identity everywhere. Among the blacks, among the yellow people, among the other Europeans. All nations, he says. We have, according to United United Nations, I think there are about 200 nations. So, fine. Among all the nations. Also, in Revelation 5 and verse 10, it says, You have called us out of every tribe and nation and tongue. So, yes, there is relics all over the place. I do believe that, brethren, firmly. And as time goes on, I keep gathering more and more proofs about that. Not only by myself i've got i've got a whole i've got some interesting friends also around the world who have been who have been so we say uh israelite identity buffs you know just like i am and they've been kind of researching that you know and and, and getting into that and, and and having all sorts of details that we don't necessarily have to know but the point is what we do have to know brethren is is amos chapter 9 verses 8 and 9 if it says all nations, that means all nations. So don't be surprised when I say, you know, don't be surprised as I was when I was in Kenya in a remote area with a wonderful, uh, interesting enough, his name is Ezekiel. 
the pastor of that church. That was my first visit. I, I, mean, I had never seen the man before. So he stands up before his congregation. He says, Shalom, Shalom. And all of them just respond, Shalom, Shalom. I ask them, do you know what is Shalom, Shalom? Where does it come from? They've got no idea, brethren. They've lost even knowledge of that. But the rest of you who are well educated certainly know where does Shalom, Shalom come. It's one of the major words in the Old Testament among the Hebrews. It's used even today by the Jewish people as a greeting. They greet one another with Shalom. Peace, peace be to you, peace be with you. So these are black people in remote Africa, brethren. Well, I wasn't surprised. Why? Because I knew Amos chapter 9, verse 8 and 9. All nations. I believe that's all nations. So don't be surprised if there are other Israelites, brethren, outside of the Israelitish nations today. In other races, in other countries, there might be, according to some estimation, perhaps even 2 billion Israelites today. In all those nations, brethren. I, that doesn't surprise me at all. Why should it? The remnant of Israel. We have said once, I think, we, as we fellowship, and uh, one of you certainly noticed, she said, isn't that beautiful? God just scattered all that seed, as he did, say, in Amos, in, in Hosea. That is, you'll see when we analyze the book of Hosea, he scattered Israel as the sea, as if you go out in the field and then you just throw the seed all over the place, brethren, and it just falls, like it says here, I'll, uh, uh, like he says, and I'll sift the house of Israel among all the nations. Grain is sifted in a sieve. That's how he'll do it. Yet he knows exactly where they are. And by doing so, what did God do? He did perform something beautiful. He actually let the seeds be in every nation. So when Jesus Christ, who is also the seed of Israel, and will be the king of Israel because the kingdom of God will be at the same time keep in mind brethren the kingdom of Israel in a such a way God has sort of with that Israelite seed has left the seed for all the nations to be able to be much easily grafted into Israel amazing beautiful wonderful truth brethren who could ever think to give up on that? Who could ever, who could ever fathom to fall away from something like this? But notice again in Amos, it's not about the Judah. It says, you know, it speaks about the house of Jacob, which of course, certainly Judah is part. But then it says in verse 9, very clearly, I will sift the house of Israel among all nations. Even though Judah was also later scattered, basically, perhaps not among all nations, but among many nations. And while Israel, will, you see, brethren, is sifted among many nations and lost their facial characteristics and their identity, well, how about Judah? Well, let's notice in Isaiah chapter 3, verses 8 and 9, because there you will find one expression which actually uh, applies only to Judah. That's Isaiah chapter 3. And verse 8 and 9, it says, For Jerusalem stumbled, verse 8, and Judah is fallen, because their tongue and their doings are against the Lord to provoke the eyes of his glory. Verse 9, to look on their countenance witness against them, and they declare their sin at Sodom, they do not hide it. Woe to their soul, for they have brought evil upon themselves. You see, both verses speak about Judah and the house of Judah. Now, show of countenance, as it says in uh, King James, uh, the look on their countenance, witnesses against them, that applies only to Judah. Because, brethren, that means that those of Israel do not, like, do not look like Jews. Even though, when I look at some of the Israelitish nations and some of their features, facial features, I could see some similarities with the Jews, indeed. You will be surprised we find people of such countenances uh, even among us here in Serbia, interestingly enough. But we understand why. We understand that they're Israelites. I've got one of my good friends here, and he looks just like Irish. He's a young man, and I, I told him once, I said, look at yourself. Have you ever realized it looks like Irish? Because some of those people did hear about my preaching about the House of Israel in Serbian, and uh, this young man wanted, 
he he even downloaded he showed me on his phone <laughs> he downloaded one of my teachings in Serbian about one particular tribe and I said to him he said do you realize you look like Celts you look like Irish people he's just just like as if you had just placed him here straight from Ireland and then he researched a little bit he said yes I do you know it's it's just amazing how how similar we are well and he's not the only one Brandon we, we we're seeing all over the place in our little town and everywhere we're seeing this presence of israelitish seed brethren even in the counties but israel doesn't look like jews they've lost that countenance of israelitish they've you know and many of them are now brethren are black and yellow and uh, some of them might be american indians why should that surprise you i've i've read this com i was reading comments of people on facebook some Indian, uh, some American Indian languages, at least I can't remember exactly which one, but we'll find it out. They have so many words similar to Hebrew. That was that's what that that is what I saw in this exchange of messages between descendants of American Indians and descendants of the Jewish people. Now, where does that where does that come from? Well, brethren, do not be surprised. America was discovered long before Columbus, brethren. Carthaginians, who had many Israelites among them, knew about America. King David knew about America. Does that shock you? Well, how do you think that the temple of, of, of God was made in Jerusalem with so much gold, brethren? Is there any gold in the... Oh yeah, somebody said in Egypt it was recently, recently discovered. We're talking now about the ancient times. Where do we read in the Bible of the ancient times that there, were, there was a gold mine? Nowhere. Where did they get all that gold from, brethren? And why is there that there is one gold mine in your coast in America which is completely depleted? Where did they get that from, brethren? Why is it depleted? Well, we'll go through that probably. There is a wonderful book written by Stephen Collins about those things. And we're going to learn about the brethren because that's also part of Bible history. So that gold came from somewhere. Well, it certainly came from rich America. America was well known because if you see various uh, uh, monuments and, 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 and stones and stuff, you'll find Hebrew, you'll find the uh, Carthaginian language, Sidonian language, uh, in fact, even in the first century, there is one, I remember reading somewhere, there was a member of God's church. Because he, the way he wrote there in America was obviously, he was a converted person. Do not be surprised, brethren. The history of America is so amazing, actually. It's so exciting, it's so beautiful. So again, I'm speaking about Israel. So the Israelites, on their way of... Uh, being scattered you know all over the place certainly they reached America so why should we be surprised if we find that some American Indian languages are so similar to Hebrew that shouldn't shock us of all the people on the face of it we shouldn't be baffled by that brethren we shouldn't be bewildered by that we shouldn't be confused by that no we shouldn't why well because we are Philadelphia we have the key of David we understand Amos chapter 9 verse 8 and 9 God sifted Israel into all the nations. Yes, indeed. And by extension to all the tribes, uh, to all the tribes and all the races. Yes, indeed. That's why you're here in a remote black area in Kenya. Shalom, shalom. That's why you have American Indian languages very similar to Hebrew. That's why you have lotus flower part of Japanese Saris regalia. That's why you have various little tribes in China, India, elsewhere, even Afghanistan, brethren, knowing and claiming. Even among the Islamic world, there are people who do understand and claim and know that they're descendants of Israel. Pashtun tribe in particular, you know, Afghanistan. I could, you know, I could just give you all sorts of facts and informations and references, but it's not the purpose of this lesson. But I'm just telling you, Amos chapter 9, verse 89, I take God for his words. He says, all nations, yes, Israel was scattered to all the nations, and Israel does not look like the Jews anymore. Now, if you go to 2 Samuel chapter 7, let's see, brethren, even when David, King David was in Jerusalem, God had to tell him something that what he would do with the house of Israel. Second Samuel chapter 7. This may surprise you. 
because you have read probably this verse many times. But now let's put it in a context. Second Samuel chapter seven verse ten. Moreover, I'll appoint a place for my people Israel, and will plant them that they may dwell in a place of their own and move no more. Nor shall the sons of wicked oppress them any more as previously. Now, what does this mean? Well, you see, David was of the house of Judah, but he was the king over all Israel. He was, in fact, the king of unified twelve tribes. That will happen exactly in the first resurrection that will happen exactly when all the remnant of Israel will be regathered in the second exodus and resurrected King David will be over them but what does it mean brethren that they were moved to dwell it says uh, you know a point a place for my people Israel so he didn't say for my people Judah and it's interesting enough as you see the Jewish people have returned to their land indeed not all of them, but portion of them. And the state of Israel is a very viable state, very functional state, extremely blessed state, out of desert, which, you know, after so many sins of, king, of the kingdom of Judah and kingdom of Israel, there, there remained desert. But out of desert, Israel made almost an oasis. And you may wonder, brethren, what are they doing there? Well, if you don't know, let me tell you very plainly what they're doing there. They're actually being there preparing the way for the remnant of Israel to come and join them. That's all God's providence. So indeed, why this small state of Israel is holding out against all of those enemies and stuff? Because it's divine plan, brethren. It is a divine plan. So part of Israel, because Judah is part of Israel, has returned and now is preparing the way for the rest of Israelites to return. But you see, Israel was in, it was said to King David, Israel will be in a place on, on his own. So basically, where did they go? Well, they went to the British Isles. They went to Ireland. They went to Northwest Europe. And as you know, for a long time, the uh, isolation of the British Isles allowed them to have a flourish, to flourish, you know, in, in, in being away from the Catholic continental Europe, they were basically allowed to flourish. So Israel was to be planted, you see, in another land and to move no more during this age. But they were also better to become something else. They were to become colonizing people. And let's see how they'll be spreading. Genesis chapter 49. There we go. To the very first book of the Bible. And I'm just reading you in these lessons just portions of what we'll be reading and analyzing in greater depth later as we are going to tackle each particular tribe. Genesis chapter 49, in verse 1, of course, you know Jacob. Jacob called his sons and said, Gather together that I may tell you what shall befall you. I'm reading from the New King James, right here. What shall befall you in the last days? So these prophecies were not for his time. These prophecies were not brethren for ancient Israel. Because the last days are this age in which we are living. But anyway, those last days could have, you know, could, could be very long as well. <laughs> the last days, because it says that God sent his own son, you know, when, uh, when the times were fulfilled. So the times have been fulfilled. We, we spoke about that this past Sabbath in the sermon. So the times have been fulfilled. So basically, since the return, since the coming first of Jesus Christ until his return, we are basically living in the end times, waiting now for his return. So let's, let's see what is this part of these end times. Who colonized all these people? Well, the English people did, didn't they? Because English people are descendants of Ephraim. So they colonized basically all the world, as it was prophesied. Genesis chapter 49, verse 22. Joseph. And Joseph is the, uh, the father of Ephraim and Manasseh. Joseph is a fruitful bough, a fruitful bough by a well. His branches run over the wall. That's the indication of colonizing better in the world. His branches run over his wall and then they spread, obviously. And also in verse, uh, I think it will be uh, chapter 28, should be, and verse 14. In chapter 28 of Genesis and in verse 14 we read we read that also your descendants this is Jacob's wow at Bethel and then he is you know speaking now to who to God of the Old Testament uh, and 
he tells him, Jesus Christ tells him, verse 14, chapter 28, and also your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth, meaning so bountiful, brethren. So, so why should you be surprised? Why should anybody be surprised when I tell you that perhaps other than Israelitish nations, considering all the other nations in the world, brethren, there might be as many as 2 billion Israelites. Who is going to count them? The dust of the earth. You shall spread around abroad to the west and the east, to the north and to the south, and in you and in your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So he will, you know, the colonizing people through the English colonization, exactly the seed of Ephraim as well spread. And it was fulfillment of the prophecy all over the earth. It was, you know, first he says spread into the west. That's exactly what happened because a large portion of Israelites, as I told you, gathered in northwest Europe. They also gathered on the British Isles. They went to the north, to the west, you know, and they, as they were kicked out by the Assyrians, by the Caspian Sea, by the Black Sea, which is in the east of Europe, today owned by Russia, as you know. Then they started migrating, and they migrated first to the west, as it says here in this prophecy, brethren. Then they moved to the east, then they went to the north, then they went to the south. That's for a long time South Africa was, as you know, a, a large Israelitish nation. Nowadays, it's you know, it's being taken over by by the Gentiles, and uh, well, it's a question whether white people will survive there. But uh, you might remember that South Africa was first colonized by the Dutch, and the Dutch are descendants of Zebulun. Later came English. And so both of those ethnicities remain there and then, you know, South Africa is very rich in diamonds and other natural resources. So Israelites were given that. Now, we notice, brethren, since Israel was never to move from this place where planted, and yet was to colonize and spread all over the earth, well, their headquarters, their throne, where the throne was planted, could not move. So the throne remains where it was transplanted. It was transplanted to the British Isles. And it did remain there. So it was overturned once in Jerusalem, transplanted to Ireland, overturned second times, went to Scotland, overturned third times, went to London. So the throne is not cannot move. However, from that headquarters, where the throne was ruling, you see, from the British Isles, this colonizing took better in place. So location today must be the same as its general location when Jeremiah planted the throne, the location of lost Israel. And therefore the prophecy is telling where the house of Israel will finally migrate from at the coming second exodus at the end of the age, they tell us where Jeremiah went. So the two succeeding overturns of the throne must not involve a change of location in general. That's exactly what it was. So the location in general was the British Isles. So the throne was just over, overturned twice within those that general location. And there it is. And it's very interesting. You can find, uh, I'm trying to, scone. Yes, I'm trying to remember the Scottish scone. That's why they call the Leah file uh, the, the, the rock which Jeremiah brought with, 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 with him. When that, uh, when that rock was moved to, from Ireland to Scotland, they call it the stone of scone. Scone is where the uh, Scottish people... Uh, Scottish people had the seat of their royal family, Scone, S-C-O-N-E, and you'll find it all on the internet. And then later that stone was moved to London. On that stone all the kings and queens of England or Britain were coronated, including Queen, current Queen Elizabeth. In 1996 though, do not be you don't have to, there is no reason to be confused, in 1996 nevertheless this stone, Leah file, was returned to Scotland because Scotland people re regarded it as part of their heritage. But, however, it's, it's now in, in a museum, but with a, with a provision that if there is any next coronation, the stone will be transported to London. So, obviously, the next you know, king, wherever he'll be coronated, will be coronated on that stone. 
because that continues exactly the tradition brethren of israel all the kings of israel were coronated on jacob's stone because the leophile or the stone of scone is regarded to be that stone on which jacob slept here in bethel when he had that dream and when he had this uh, struggle against the lord asking him for blessing and that's the stone that he anointed that's the stone which is considered to be jacob's stone and for a long time when the stone was at westminster westminster abbey there was a notice next to it jacob's pillow stone later that was removed i guess satan just wants to downplay the truth but amazing enough the stone of scone is also called jacob's stone you see all the kings of israel were coronated on that one in in the holy land in the promised land later as israel separated the uh, all the Jewish kings that remained in Jerusalem from the line of David were also coronated on it. But Jeremiah, that stone, as he plucked up that throne from Jerusalem, transported the stone to Ireland. And then from Ireland it was later transported to Scone in Scotland. Later it was transported to London. Now it is being resting in Scotland, but nevertheless next coronation should be at that stone brethren that's another thing that we should be knowing that's also part of the key of david given to philadelphia brethren we understand all of these ins and outs because god has revealed them to us if we are truly philadelphia remnant now after being carrying to assyria which i mentioned Let's go to Hosea chapter 12 and one of these days we'll go through the entire book because Hosea is basically Hosea is basically the history of the house of Israel. Hosea chapter 12 the Assyrians took Israelites away from their promised land. They settled Babylonian and Persian and Assyrian tribes uh, to replace the uh, Israelites and then Ephraim went somewhere now Ephraim is mentioned brethren in the Bible also as because Ephraim is the leading tribe so often when you read about Ephraim in the Bible as we mentioned in one of our lectures that refers to all the ten tribes of Israel because Ephraim was given the greatest blessing Ephraim was given uh, the blessing to become colonizing people to form a commonwealth or a group of nation nations that is and uh, Ephraim when it is dust dust because it has got the greatest portion of blessings when you see you know Ephraim that refers to the ten tribes chapter 12 of Hosea verse 1 Ephraim feeds on the wind and pursues the east wind it's interesting east wind well the east wind let me remind you brethren the east wind blows to which direction blows to west so Ephraim, after being called the Ten Tribes, after being basically resettled by the Assyrians, plucked up, plucked out of their promised land, they were settled around the Caspian and the Black Sea, they continued, started moving west. And then, as they moved west, we'll see in next lesson, they followed the Dan's Serpent Trail, from which the river Danube is named. They moved west from these eastern parts, which today are parts of Russian land. They moved west and settled, of course, in Western Europe, and they settled on the British Isles. Now, in Jeremiah, let's go back to Jeremiah chapter 3. Where is a message sent to Israel? Jeremiah chapter 3. Where is the message now, the prophecy sent to Israel? Now keep in mind, this is Israel, which is no longer in its own land. It is out of its land. And Ezekiel, who was set by God to be the, set over Israel to be the watchman of Israel, could not, was not able to deliver that message again. So that message that Ezekiel didn't deliver, brethren, remained for our times. Because his message remained for modern Israel. He is no longer with us. Ezekiel has been long dead. So brethren, who is having now commission of Ezekiel to fulfill? It's us. It's those who have the key of David. It is Philadelphia remnant. 
keep that in mind that's part as well of preaching of the gospel that's part of what we are to be doing in this world that's why the old WCG in its efforts to reach Israelites also printed uh, printed basically the plain truth magazine into all the language of Israelites including even Sp Spanish and Portuguese for a while at least because a lot, large portion of Portuguese and Spaniards, uh, there were a large portion of Israelites there because the migration of Israelites, you'll see it from other historical sources that will might cover one of these days. There was a, this large migration that was going actually also through the Iberian Peninsula. Iberian Peninsula got its name from Heber, H-E-B-E-R, Heber, who is the father of Heberites or Hebrews. And you might remember that also Ireland for some for quite some period of time was also called Iberian Iberia or Iberian Isle. Anyway, we are in Jeremiah chapter three. Where is a message sent to Israel? Now this is dual prophecy, of course, not only to ancient Israel, but to the modern one. Chapter three, verse eleven. Then the Lord said to me, backsliding Israel. What was it backsliding? Well, what did they do, brethren? They were just called out of paganism, of all this idolatry, of Egypt, of Egypt, which was the greatest idolatrous nation on the face of the earth. They were called out of the house of bondage, and they were just kept backsliding back, brethren. They didn't want to stay faithful to God, so they just backslided. They were backsliding into paganism and idolatry. So backsliding Israel verse 11 the lord said backsliding israel has shown herself more righteous than treacherous judah as i mentioned to you in one of the bible study brethren we again yes for some time in the holy land there were some few faithful jewish kings and judah was somewhat faithful but judah was also kicked out of its land a century and almost a half later because it was treacherous to god and it was even worse than israel so even today, let us not again, let us not just, because there are people who are saying, oh, Judah remained faithful, Judah is great, Judah is today even faithful, and look, Israel is lost, and so on. Well, no, Judah is not faithful to God, because Judah is not keeping, really, the spirit of the law. Judah has made tradi a traditional religion, which does have some very great wisdom because you know the the, the 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 jewish the jewish rabbis and scholars have spent a lot of time reading the old testament and they grew up in that culture so sometimes we can learn some very good things from them you'll see in the book of ruth i'll mention for example some of the jewish commentaries on on the age for example of, the, of, of ruth and boaz uh, but so be it we can draw the wisdom but we cannot imbibe the religion with there because their religion is also man-made man-made religion well remember before the Passover I showed you how they keep the Passover on the wrong date so they've got man-made religion with all sorts of rules and regulations which are just burdensome that's what Jesus Christ came into conflict with them he didn't join Pharisees he didn't join the Sadducees he didn't join the churches of his world brethren he came and preached the gospel of the kingdom remember in the Galilee we spoke last Sabbath why the church he came to the Galilee and he began preaching the gospel repent ye and believe the gospel so let us not again we love Judah of course we don't hate the Jewish people God forbid but we put them into right perspective when it comes to their relationship with God they're just as treacherous brethren as as the backsliding Israel so backsliding has shown himself more righteous than the church of Judah. Verse 12, go and proclaim these words toward the north. Oh, there we go, north. So first of all, in Hosea we read how Israel was catching the eastern wind. Eastern wind blows to the west. Now we see here in this very verse, it says, you know, go to the north and say, return now, Jeremiah was, was in the Promised Land. Jeremiah was in Jerusalem. So God tells him, go north. Well, brethren, we have to go north. But not only north, because Israel was catching eastern winds, so Israel went west. So you have west and north of the Holy Land. Go north 
and proclaim these words toward the north and say, Return, backsliding Israel, says the Lord, I will not cause my anger to fall on you. For I am merciful, says the Lord, I will not remain angry forever. Yes, he is merciful. I will be preaching, brethren, also mercy and grace to you and love. But I will never neglect to tell you about the first and the second beast, about the identity of Israel, about various historical things that we need to understand. And I'll keep warning you about this ecumenism, about this, about Revelation 17.5. All of this churchianity now has come together as one great big family. They've got the mother, harlot is there, harlot in spiritual sense, and all these daughters, you know, are there. Her Protestant ones, churches that pro protested against her now they're all banded together with them so this ecumenical happy family brethren is having only one protest now to make they cannot protest anymore against the, the catholics they'll all together now protest against the truth and against those who preach the truth who are those well that's us we're pretty much the only ones preaching the truth the whole truth there are others who preach parts of the truth yes we pretty much are the only ones now preaching and <coughs> we are remaining alone in that preaching the whole truth that's the only true way forward brethren let us never be afraid of that and uh, so where will they come from now at that great forthcoming second exit where will where would the israelites come from we are in jeremiah chapter 3 let's go to verse 18 in those days the house of Judah shall walk with the house of Israel and they shall come together out of the land of the north to the land that I have given as an inheritance to your fathers. Again, north, brethren. However, not only north, let's go to now chapter 31 of Jeremiah, which is the focus, which is again chapter about the second exodus. And you'll find about it in my in my sermon. You'll find it's quoted as well. Parts of this chapter quoted in my sermon, the great second coming of uh, second coming uh, coming uh, the great second coming of Israel uh, of Israel out of his uh, or how did I entitle it? The great second coming, perhaps Exodus in Serbian. I've entitled it to say great, the great second coming of Israel out of his bondage, because Israel is going to be in bondage again, brethren, in severe bondage yoke terrible yoke and yes i'm going to preach to you those things no matter how how somebody will say oh it is so hard and if it's so negative no it's not negative it is the word of god it's part of the inspired word of god and it cannot be negative it is there for a purpose because yes even though it's a harsh truth nevertheless the outcome will be great the outcome will be the remnant of israel repentant people who will finally come to their senses and to understanding who they are and why such harsh horrible conditions were fallen were you know befell them they will know especially when the two witnesses will will come on the scene and i think it's again time brethren Another element about the mission of the two witnesses is to understand. Yes, they're witnessing against the beast. They're witnessing against the whole system. But why, brethren? Why? Because the whole system of this world is going to enslave the house of Israel. And the two witnesses, in effect, like Moses and Aaron, will be also telling the beast one important thing. Let my people go. Release my people. And then those Israelites who survive in the captivity, many of them because of the two witnesses, and them remembering that somebody before them preached to them about their identity will come to their senses. Jeremiah 31 verse 8. Behold, I'll bring them from the north country and gather them from the ends of the earth, among them the blind and the lame, the women, a woman with child and the one who labors with child together, a great throng shall return there a great throng brethren you have noticed it says about the it speaks about the north country but it says from the ends of the earth who would be the ends of the earth well all these aloof islands what is the most isolated continent in the world australia 
Look at New Zealand, that's the end of the world. The tips of North America, Canada, that will be the end of the world as well, brethren. South Africa, if there will be any remnant of Israel there, South Africa will be the end of the world. Up there north, Shetland Islands, you know, the British Islands are the ends of the, of the, of the, of the world. See Hosea, chapter 11, that's where he'll be bringing them from, yes, Hosea chapter 11. And uh, verse 8, Hosea 11, verse 8. How can I give you up Ephraim? How can I, Ephraim again, being the uh, leader of all ten tribes. How can I hand you over Israel? So no Judah, but it's Israel. How can I make you like Adma? How can I set you like Zeboim? My heart churns within me, my sympathy is stirred. I'll not, not execute the fierceness of my anger. I'll not again destroy Ephraim. For I am God and not man, the Holy One in your midst, and I will not come with terror. Verse 10. They shall walk after the Lord. He will roar like a, like a lion. When he roars, then his sons shall come trembling from the west so we have the west and we have the north brethren now isaiah chapter 49 also tells us where those remnant of israel the outcasts of israel will be coming from isaiah chapter 49 and we will certainly return to these verses again 49 verse 3 and he said to me you are my servant O Israel in whom I'll be glorified look verse let's drop to verse 6 indeed he says it is too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the uh, the preserved ones of Israel I'll also give you as a light to the Gentiles that you should be my salvation to the ends of the earth look at verse 12 surely these shall come from afar look those from the north and the west and these from the land of sinim now vulgata says translates sinim as australia now those from the north and west brethren so far we have only north and west north and west there is no east there is no south but north and west in Hebrew language, there is no term northwest. That's why here in Isaiah chapter 49, verse 12, we see read north and west. So thus some texts, you know, say from the west, some from the north. And it was all, however, from the northwest. Northwest of where? Well, Jerusalem is the focal point of all the earth. So it's northwest of Jerusalem. Draw a line northwest from Jerusalem and see where we end up, brethren. Where do we end up? Well, we end up there. Where is, the, where is the throne of David? From where the colonizing took place. Go to Psalm 89. Remember, we talked about Psalm 89 when we spoke about the uh, covenant between God and David. And as God promised to David, there will be always a descendant of his on his throne. He said in verse 25, uh, in Psalm 89, verse 25, he said, Also, I'll set his hand over the sea and his right hand over the rivers so god said he would set or plant david's throne over the sea so we're having northwest of europe over the sea brethren and look at now go back to isaiah chapter 49 i wanted to read you uh verse one but i left it on purpose to read it now Verse 1, Isaiah 49, Listen, O coastlands, to me. In some translations it says, listen, listen, isles, to me. And this is coastlands. Coastlands, lands that have only coasts. Well, who are the coasts? Well, the British Isles. Even their colonies, except for South Africa, are also coastlands. Are, isn't Australia a coastland? Isn't New Zealand a coastland? But listen to the isles, it says in some translations. The isles. Northwest, over the sea, the throne over the sea. Listen, O coastlands, to me, and take heed, you peoples, from afar. 
The Lord has called me from the from the womb, from the matrix of my mother. He has made mention of my name. So where does Isaiah locate Israel? On the Isles. Now back to Jeremiah. How and where does Jeremiah identify and locate Israel? Jeremiah 31. In Jeremiah chapter 31, we read verses 6 and 7. Jeremiah 31, verse 6. For there shall be a day when the watchman will cry on Mount Ephraim, Arise, and let us go up to Zion, to the Lord our God. Watchman of Ephraim, brethren. Ten tribes. Zion, we know where is Zion. It's in the Holy Land, in the Promised Land, in their land. Let's go to Zion, to the house of our God. Verse 7, For thus says the Lord, Sing with gladness for Jacob, and shout among the chief of the nations. Proclaim and give praise, and say, O Lord, save your people, the remnant of Israel. Verse 10, Hear the word of the Lord, O nations, and declare it in, in, in the isles afar off, and say, he who scattered Israel will gather him and keep him as a shepherd does his flock. Isles, brethren. Northwest Isles. Northwest coastlands. Isles afar off. Also, let's go to Isaiah again. Verse 51. That's another second Exodus chapter, brethren, which I mentioned, of course, in that sermon about the second Exodus. Those of you who may not be familiar with the second Exodus, please try to obtain that sermon here. You know, ask me for the link. It is important for you to understand the second Exodus. It is very present doctrine in the Bible, which again, for whatever, for whatever reason, is not being preached by these various churches of God, which is probably an indication of their lukewarmness about the truth of God. But we, as the Philadelphia Remnant, will continue to preach that truth to the very end. Because we will be involved in that second Exodus, brethren. Well, who do you think, brethren, will be liberating Israel, captured Israel from concentration camps, death camps, those who survive? Who do you think will be doing that, brethren? Who will be delivering them from the prisons of Assyrians, from the yoke of bondage that Assyrians are going to put them upon them, brethren? Who do you think will be doing that? But us, of course. Us. We will be delivering them, brethren, and bringing them back to their land. Isaiah 51, verse 4 and 5. Listen to me, my people, and give ear to me, O my nation, for law will proceed from me, and I'll make my justice rest as the light of the peoples. My righteousness is near, my salvation has gone forth, and my arms will judge the peoples. The coastlands, or the isles again, will wait upon me, and on my arm they will trust. In chapter 42, we shall read four more verses, brethren, for this lesson in chapter 42 of Isaiah. Verse 3 and 4. A bruised reed he will not break, and smoking flax he will not quench. He will bring forth justice for truth. He will not fail nor be discouraged till he has established justice in the earth. And the coastlands shall wait for his law. Coastlands, isles, again, whatever. They're waiting for his law. Verse 10. Sing to the Lord a new song. And his praise from the ends of the earth. Again, ends of the earth. Brethren, what are the ends of the earth? There where Ephraim came. From ends of the earth. You who go down to the sea and all that is in it, you coastlands and you inhabitants of them. Let the wilderness and its cities lift up their voice, the villages that Kedar inhabits. Let the inhabitants of Selah Sela, which is the other name for Petra, the inhabitants of Sela sing, let them shout from the top of the mountains. We read about this when we talked about Petra, the place of safety. We'll return to this verses one of these days because I've got a few more things to tell you about the coming place of safety. Verse 12, let them give glory to the Lord and declare his praise in the coastlands. 
So brethren, the location therefore where the Israelites are lost and they are found today is north and west, northwest of Jerusalem, over the sea in the Isles. Okay, there is only one location when you draw a line from Jerusalem. Northwest over the sea, there is only brethren one location, unmistakably the British Isles. Known as the Great Britain, known as the United Kingdom. Great Britain fulfills every prophecy and the British Isles are located northwest of Jerusalem. 